So welcome everyone to the First Unitarian Church of Honolulu's Tuesday night Pauhana. We are so honored to have with us today Pulama Long and Luana Peterson, the founders and operators of Weaving Our Stories, which is, uh, I'll, I'll let them tell you more about it, but it's a, one of the most beautiful ways I've seen recently here on the island of lifting up uh, voices of uh, those who have been sometimes disappeared or voiceless in these islands, especially you know, youths of color, young people of color, and showing how the experience of uh, their lives and the stories they tell are so wound together with so many other stories that we tell. And um, it's, uh, it's a real honor to have you both. Do you wanna just say hi and, and tell us a little bit about uh, how your day is going and how you're doing? <laughs> Okay, I'll go. Go ahead, Pilo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, aloha, everybody. So I'm Pulama. Um, my day is going pretty good. Um, most, um, most of the time, the hat that I wear is an educator. Um, so a lot of organizing um, around workshops and working with different education institutions. Um, to teach the cultural practice that I'm very connected to, which is weaving. So that has taken up most of my day, but um, just thank you all for having us. And it's really nice to see the faces behind the support that we're getting. So mahalo. Great. Luana? Aloha, everybody. I'm Luana Peterson, and I'm the other half of Weaving Our Stories. Um, how has my day been? Yeah, it's been a lot of, Paloma and I have a couple of workshops coming up, uh, actually like, actually on Friday and Saturday, so preparing for that. Um, and then as you know, with COVID, you know, our lives have kind of been turned upside down. So we got kids at home. And so today was, you know, navigating distance learning and, and things like that. Um, but the, the hat that I wear is primarily an educator outside of the home, um, storyteller and part-time community organizer. So doing all right, juggling. And I think haven't dropped too many balls yet. I was gonna say, you guys need more heads for all the hats you're wearing. That's we all do. <laughs> <laughs> Can, uh, yeah, we, we some, some of the congregation know uh, because I played uh, a part of your video that you graciously provided us at our annual sort of report on how the church is going. But a lot, there's a lot of interest in what you're doing. And as you could see, by the way, our church came to support you uh, and weaving our stories. But can, for those who aren't fully aware, can you talk a little bit about uh, what weaving our stories is? Uh, I mean, I played the video and so they have a sense, but like maybe just kind of give us a sense uh, in your words, like uh, what it is and kind of where you're at with it right now. <laughs> what, uh, well, I could talk about where we started, kind of like the origin story of Weaving Our Stories, and then maybe Pulama, you can talk about where we are. Um, so Pulama and I are former colleagues. We worked for a program called, uh, we worked for a program called Julia Mahi, um, which was a Native Hawaiian-based education program. And so we were primarily in the elementary um, aged classes. And we developed and de delivered curriculum that was focused on Hawaiian values um, and a love for the land. And Pulama and I got to talking just kind of in our personal time and our downtime in between meetings and conferences, we started talking about our own individual stories. Um, I'm not native Hawaiian, though I was raised here and Pulama is, and we started to realize just kind of in getting to know one another that we aren't really sharing our stories in Hawaii, that there are these assumptions that because we are diverse, um, that we know each other, because we exist alongside each other, that we know each other, but um, we're not having enough opportunities to really exchange our stories, and we're not having enough opportunities to listen to one another. So that was where Weaving Our Stories was born and we've taken kind of our experiences as educators in the Native Hawaiian um, educator world. Um, Pulama is bringing her cultural practices as a weaver. So as we're exchanging, the original idea and then COVID happened, um, as we're exchanging our stories across diverse communities, we're also learning the 
Native Hawaiian cultural practice of weaving. So there's that physical aspect of weaving as we're weaving together our communities um, and building solidarity. So that's where kind of the idea was born. And then I'll let Mama kind of talk about where we're at now. Thank you, Luana. It's beautiful. Yeah. So we did, um, so after getting together and creating Weaving Our Stories, we did like almost a year of just creating curriculum and then feeling like, okay, should we go for a grant? Should we do this? Um, and then that's kind of where Hawaii Community Bail Fund um, started to reach out to us and see that the work we were doing on Instagram, which is like the video and the content and the interviews of just getting people's stories and starting to like weave them together and seeing similarities and differences. And so they have been able to graciously fund us in putting on a year long series of workshops and working with um, young community organizers or those who are interested in doing such and providing um, education resources, tools, and get really letting us have um, the opportunity to do what we want to do and what we envision. And so we've done three, two workshops so far. We're doing our third one at the end of this week. Um, we have a solid group of six participants um, and they all come from different backgrounds of healthcare, poetry, art, math. One of our participants, she's only 16. So she's really taking that like initiative to be a part of this. And, um, and we're working with them on creating and helping them to design a community impact project. So we know that that goes, there's a lot of work. And so we're trying to get them as much tools and feeling of support and confidence to take their ideas and their passions and see how they can help their communities and whatever issues that they have um, an interest in. And so we mix it with guest speakers, um, content and curriculum, and then we do also mentorships um, included as well. So they get those broader stories, they get people who are doing the work in their communities, those, those experiences, able to share dialogue and ask questions. Um, so, yeah. That's wonderful. That's, uh, thank you, and very beautiful, Paloma. Thank you both. Um, it's wonderful. It, I just am feeling a lot of joy just hearing that this work is happening. And it also sounds like a tremendous amount of work to do while you're also living lives and having kids at home and, and going in and out. And how is it, how are you feeling? This is just the pastor in me just saying that like, it's a lot to be shouldering. Is it going well? Or are you feeling tired? Or are you feeling inspired or like, or just an ebb and flow? Can you both kind of talk about how it's how it's been feeling for you? Um, I'll go. I mean, I, you know, there definitely have been challenges, but I feel very blessed to work with somebody like Pulama. Um, though we are kind of coming from different lived experiences, we can be very honest with one another. Um, and we hold ourselves to, we hold ourselves accountable. She holds me accountable. I hold her accountable. Um, and that's really refreshing, especially right now, as we know, like the political climate um, or just the climate in general is, is pretty heavy right now. So like when you started off by sharing the, the Black Lives Matter um, sign being torn down, it just it's really heartwarming to know that you guys are holding yourselves and your community accountable and like are putting up the sign over and over again and finding out. So with Pulama, that's kind of the relationship we have. Um, and it's refreshing for me, and I think it's refreshing for our community because uh, for so long those stories we've been, our, our different communities have been rendered invisible, right? Oh, the anti-Blackness doesn't exist in Hawaii, but yet we know the signs are being torn down. And yet, you know, we know that racism does exist here. And so in this space with Pulama and with the youth, we're able to be honest. So while it's a lot, it's also, um, it, it fills our cup. Yeah. So for me personally, it's, it's been healing to have this relationship with Pulama and, and with the youth as well. Yeah. And Pulama, how are you doing with it all? Um, yeah, I just want to echo like 
I think me and Luana's relationship, the type of trust um, and holding each other accountable just does so much in a type of workspace where there is a lot of demand. Um, and after every time where we do a workshop or have more of a personal engagement with one of the youth, it is just so fulfilling for both of us to just be there for the young people and be like and be there in a support of, you know, you don't have to over explain how you're feeling or what you're going through. We understand and they can talk to us and they we just having that type of community with these six participants is um, just more than whatever I could ask for and that we're putting in practice what we're saying. And so we can take that into other spaces and into other education work as well. So yeah. there's, there's more of that um, uplifting and empowering um, that outweighs the stress. <laughs> oh, so I, I'm really, um interested in a little bit of like, I mean, Luana, you sort of talked about uh, getting to know Kulama and Kulama, you talked about getting to know Luana, but was there a moment you can talk about when this idea came to you? Was it something you both always had or was it something that working together that came up? How, can you talk a little more about maybe the feelings around or the, and then the, the trajectory of this project? Was there a, an event or, or something or like an aha moment? Something like that. You're both smiling, so the answer is probably yes. <laughs> but go ahead. Do you want to go, Kulama? You go. Okay. Um, I think both of us as educators talking about what we're not seeing in education. I think that always, like, what do we envision for a future of education that really? Um, empowers students and has educators that believe in them. And it's like all of these things that should just be automatic, but we see a lot of barriers in education where students don't feel this way. Um, and so I think that aha moment is just being like, I don't only see this, you see this too. Like, let's do something about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things we do at our church is we have uh, a thing called chalice circles. And in the chalice circles, we do a thing uh, called deep, deep listening. And I was, uh, and there's also another, uh, what, what people do is I ask them to send me questions privately so I can kind of organize them and stack them. And it doesn't distract you uh, from uh, uh, as you're, as you're kind of thinking and forming answers. But one of the, one of the questions was, um, Lama, you mentioned a listening space and creating a listening space. And can you just say more about that, about what that looks like for you? Is there a cultural practice piece of that? Or is it just is, as an educator, like uh, learning how to do that and practice it? But can you say more about what a listening space looks like for you and the folks you're working with? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, as part of my um, methodology in education, um, is to really hear what students have to say. And I think that really dictates how I navigate as a educator, as a teacher, and how I reflect on my own practices as a teacher. And so working in public schools, especially, um, there's a lot of kids who are having a really hard time at home and um, them acting out or not listening there's deeper things rooted in that. And sometimes the everyday teacher cannot see that or just has too much on their plate. And so for me, having the, having to, having the pleasure of being an educator that's outside of like the school's demand um, to really listen to these students and feel like, and they just want to be listened to. They don't want to be told what they should and shouldn't be doing. They just, um, they just need someone that respects their voice. Yeah, that goes beyond just wanting to love them and care for them, but really wanting to respect them and um, and what they have to say. And do you just to follow up on that a little bit? Do you get the sense that? Um, do you get the sense? I, I don't know. Sometimes I get the sense that people under a certain age, uh, it's a, it's kind of exhausting to explain how they're feeling. Uh, and all the things that are going on. Sometimes I try to explain that uh, 
people under a certain age are already at a certain level of social justice awareness of what they think is supposed to be happening. And to just con to have to keep explaining it to folks who aren't there yet, whether uh, sociologically or, or otherwise, um, it's just something I see with youth. Is that something you've seen before that it's just like, how are you not getting this kind of frustration? Oh yeah, and I think Luana can speak to this um, as well. Of um, we need to be we need to be establishing communities where um, we're taking away that exhaustion, mm -hmm. that like unneeded exhaustion, because we need to be the doing the work within ourselves to be educating ourselves, um, to be learning. That needs to be a priority for our own um, growth and development and how we approach ourselves in certain spaces. Okay. And Luana, uh, do you wanna, yeah, follow up with that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess that would cut across, you know, many different communities, whether it's the youth um, or people of color, but I, I think we're all kind of tired of kind, uh, kind of trying to prove or teach how these systems of oppression affect us or, you know, prove or convince other folks that we exist and we are here and our story matters. Um, and while there's a place for that, I think Pulama and I are more focused on working with youth and not, we're not really there in a position to teach them, but just to provide space for ourselves and for the youth um, to learn and to bear witness to their lives um, and kind of move away from this concept of we're here to teach you or we're here to be a sage on the stage, but really we're here to uplift each other. Um, and, and to listen, because I, I think I can speak for Paloma and a lot of us, like it, it, it does get exhausting whether you're 19 years old or you're a 42 year old black woman who's have been having to teach and to explain and to convince uh, kind of for many generations that this is my story. Um, so yeah, I guess all that to say, we're, we're, we're here to share and to, and to uplift, but more so to just to provide space that's, that's not, there, I, th I mean, it's there, um, but we're contributing to that space, I guess I should say. It's so exciting because I just have this image of when folks have been through like, just the, the creativity and, and when, when folks have not had a space to fully express themselves, how they're feeling, and also what you're talking about is engaging in the wider you know, society around them to, to affect kinds of changes or to understand at least around them uh what is happening uh i mean you must see some amazing innovations and some like unbelievable creativity coming out when when someone finally has that free space it just fills up sometimes i mean you get over usually there's some trauma and some pieces and trust that you have to build first but have you started to see this kind of bubbling up or this kind of outpouring that's starting to happen from the six young people that you're working with so far yeah I'll, I mean, I'll go. I mean, yes, absolutely. Um, so like Paloma was saying, we have a diverse group of six young black youth from um, 16 to 25, I think. And they're all interested in different things, but the, the ideas that they're coming up with. So the cumulative project for this year long series is a community impact design project, um, but also them kind of designing and imagining their own pillars of liberation in contrast to the systems of oppression that they live under. Uh, and they're coming up all with all kinds of beautiful and totally doable um, ideas and responses to these systems of oppression. So one, I spoke with Aurora this weekend. She is at um, Vassar College and she's really interested in how health education can address systems of oppression because she's seeing really that our, it, it's, it's our bodies that are the for, first point of, of confrontation with these systems, so how can we start to teach in the school system uh, within health education ways that we can uh, support and embrace the individual in all of their, their wholeness, um, kind of in contrast to what we see with objectification and consumerism and um, really support the spectrum of sexuality. And um, so that's one of those ideas. And we have Noah, who's an amazing, um, 
poet. He's also in the master's program with Yale Divinity, and he's really interested in using poetry as a means for expressing kind of his lived experiences, but also avenues for liberation for his own community. Um, and he's coming from LA, the Watts area. So it's it's really interesting for them to see that it, it can really start simple with their own story. And from that story, they're able to unearth this beautiful blueprint um, for their liberation. I've heard good things about Yale Divinity School. Sorry. Have that's, you? That's where I went, yeah. Oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, uh, that's beautiful. Yeah, some people are kind of wondering about some specific examples or some ideas of, that are starting to, to kind of fill that, to fill that space. Um, and that's beautiful. And then I think Nancy asked a question is, you know, sort of what, what is, what is, what's going to happen with the stories? I mean, is the, I mean, really is that, I mean, is the community impact and there's the studies and, and what is the, what's the hope? It, maybe it's for each individual person, they have their own set of objectives, uh, but could you kind of give a sense of, of what the, the overall arc is here for folks. Do you want to go, Paloma? Um, sure. So, so we're we're at this point in time. We're working on having them really map out um, their pillars of liberation, and then the design of their community impact projects, incorporating all of their passions and stories. And with that um, development, we are also bringing in um, a very talented visual artist who has done our videos named Summer. And so she's gonna be working with um, the young organizers too, to help in documenting this process. And so hopefully by that time, um, we can put something together, rather be a digital magazine and a, and a um, actual physical presentation. Um, of their process and documenting their stories and how they've done this. Um, but eventually, I mean, our ultimate goal is that through the time and the effort that goes into these design projects that they in some way can be implemented and to give them as much of the resources that we can um, in helping them to do that as well. Yeah, I. Uh, that's, that's great. Um, I mean, this is the kind of stuff just so you know, like, Doctoral, doctoral work in divinity is literally the same idea. You have to have a community project that is community outreach. You have to track the pro. It's like there's curricula at BU, you know, where Dr. King did his doctorate. There's uh, curricula at uh, Emory and other like doctoral, you know, doctor of ministry that do this exact thing. So they're working at sort of this uh, similar uh, idea, but uh, when they should, you know, when they're young and have the energy and can go out and do that instead of when uh, instead of later in life. Um, yeah, I had already written down Pillars of Liberation because I'm going to steal it for a sermon title. But uh, we also, uh, but some people were wondering, you know, can you talk more about this idea? It sounds beautiful, the idea of working on and finding these pillars of liberation. Does that come from a teacher? Is it something uh, that you are working on or putting out? And can you say more about the, that process of finding them and what it means? So. Um, sure. So Pillars of Liberation um, was birthed out of looking at pillars of oppression um, and the systems and how that is used in the ways that it oppresses communities. Um, so our Pillars of Liberation really focuses on if they look at their design project, then one pillar is the institutions, people and community that can help them in executing their projects. And then the, we have a middle pillar that speaks directly to the education and ideology. So it's kind of like taking, well, what is the structures of systems of oppression that they use? Of course, they use education and certain ideologies um, within the school systems um, and the institutions that uphold these powers of systems of oppression. And so we're kind of just flipping the script on it and seeing how can we organize this in a different way. Um, and then those two things, the communities, organizations that can help us to the type of education and ideologies that we wanna put um, goes to a third pillar, pillar, which is how do those two things with our community 
impact um, projects can help in changing the behaviors, the values, and the empowerment of our communities. So it's like these stepping stones that can get us into spaces where we're actually um, deconstructing the mental um, lived oppression that's around us and rebuilding something that's different, um, that feels empowered, that changes our values and our behaviors and all of those things. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's really the definition of liberation is taking the tools of the oppressor and turning them around, uh, using it to your advantage. Um, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, I think we lost, uh, we, we lost Luana. Uh, I, I'm guessing she's going to uh, log back in when she can. So we'll just, uh, we'll just go ahead. Um, yeah, one thing, you know, I was kind of curious about was, you know, what it is that, uh, you know, I, I'm noticed I, you were explaining the, um, the uh, Hawaii Community Bail Fund came in uh, to help and you mentioned kind of offhand that relationship between uh, why it makes sense. And to me, like hearing how jails and jail works and education, sometimes people don't understand the relationship to those two things. But man, in Hawaii, is it, it might be one of the most profound and intense uh, school to prison pipelines in any place I've ever lived. Uh, now, sometimes when I say that kind of lingo, people can check out. Can you say something about your feeling of the connection between uh, education and the, the, to me, the justice of having someone trying to end cash bail being who is funding education? Uh, can you say more about that or how that feels right for you or... Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think of it as directly as um, the ways that we use punishment and um, and labels and just everything of how we set up inside the school system. Um, and we don't have the resources, we don't have spaces in schools where there's counseling, where there's healing, where there's reflection. Um, after school programs are super rare, um, but suspension is at its highest. And um, the only solution is to completely remove the student. And so this type of behavior and how we're teaching in that sense is that school to prison pipeline. And um, so, yeah, I feel like it's directly connected um, and it is something that, as an extension of the work that we're doing that I'm super passionate about in um, trying to dismantle that type of system. Yeah, yeah, when we, when you, when we, uh, when you stepped away, Luana, we were just, I was asking a little bit about how the school to prison pipeline works and the kind of the beauty of having the bail fund trying to address education and seeing that connection as being uh, essential, it seems mm -hmm. like such an appropriate partner uh, in this in this time. Uh, so I don't know if there's anything you wanted to say about that or, or. Yeah, I'm sorry I stepped out. My computer's been acting up. When I move it, it shuts down. But I here I am. <laughs> um, so you asked me to comment, kind of like on the relationship with the Bell Fund and looking at the school to prison yeah. pipeline, or like the birth birth to <laughs> prison pipeline. Yeah. Preach. Um, yeah, I, I think it was kind of a very uh, appropriate connection for Pulama and I, um, because when we look at uh, some of the problems that we see in our communities or challenges, um, they relate directly to not only the systems that, uh, that we live under, but kind of like just generational trauma um, that we inherit from these systems. And so, the bail fund, I think, was, you know, kind of right in seeing that programs like these kind of start to address um, those preventative measures that we need to have in place if we want to see reduction in, in, in our prison population. But more so than that, we could start talking to our 
community members to see that, you know, there are family members. I can talk personally that um, the prison industrial complex has taken most of the males in my family and a lot of them for having done nothing. You know, my grandfather was killed by a policeman in the 50s for doing nothing. And so um, we can talk about preventative measures, but also we can start to share stories with one, other, one another to say like, we're not even doing anything and we're getting caught up in this prison industrial complex. So really these stories, you know, we wanna share them and it's bearing witness, but it's also data collecting. What is going on in our communities? How are we getting caught up um, in these systems? And yeah, I'm really grateful to be paired with the church because then we're also talking about how is that affecting our spirituality um, and, and with the Bell Fund as well, um, looking at these systems. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned, you started to get into this. I have a spiritual practice of not asking people to, um, to, to bear witness of their trauma if, if they don't want to uh, or at all. Uh, so when I, I just want to say that first before I ask this question, say that you have no, have no requirement to share anything that uh, you don't feel this group has earned, to be honest. Uh, that's the way we look at it. Like you earn trust. And, you know, so that's my precursor to ask um, that part of what you mentioned coming together was sharing your differences, but also your similarities. And could you say something about that? I mean, even just the one of what you were sharing of your own experience, um, and Pulama, I'm sure here also um, in your family, I, I can only imagine, but I'd rather not just imagine, but ask you, what are those things you found in common and some of the ways that uh, you thought you found difference? Um, can you say some more about uh, those things? Yeah, I mean, I could start, I mean, Pulama and I uh, are both of mixed ancestry. Um, and we're, I think we're both cognizant of the fact that uh, as a result of that mixed ancestry, we carry privileges um, because of that. And so we're very honest about that. And I think it's important to be honest about the privilege we carry. Uh, it's an unfortunate fact that because I have lighter skin or because I have darker skin than Pulama, I'm going to navigate this world very differently. Um, but it's the truth of the matter. And so we've been able to mm -hmm. kind of like share our experiences around those privileges that we carry, um, but also then share our frustrations around that because um, while these ideas of race and identity and colorism, they're artificial, they're still very real, um, but they take away from our identity in a way and our ancestry um, and our connection to family and heritage because if, you know, for example, my son is white passing, um, that does that take away from the fact that he has a black grandmother and a black grandfather? No, but he's gonna live his life very differently. And that can be frustrating as well. I don't know if I'm making sense, but Pulama and I are able to articulate it when we get together. <laughs> so it's like we've um, yeah, been able to connect that way in terms of the, the varying ways we're able to I, navigate the world based on these intersecting systems of oppression based on class and race and color and sex. Um, yeah. yeah. Fulama, do you have any on the similarities and also maybe the differences where there was some difference that, that you were maybe teaching each other or learning something you didn't know before, something like that? Um, yeah, Luana, do you mind if I sharing the story with, um, showing up for you for the, um, yeah, okay. yeah the, the PD, yeah, the PD, um, so to give a little story, um, so us working together, um, with professional development for, um, public school teachers was around, um, the beginning of, this huge movement for Black Lives Matter and um, seeing a lot of the community in the streets and all of this. Uh, so the organizers of the PD thought that it would be um, relevant to talk about it, um, but there was a lot of backpedaling um, because they wanted to keep the teachers still engaged and they, there was just this, a, a lot of back and forth. Um, and so Luana asked me to um, kind of 
be that voice um, and stepping up for her in that type of way. Um, and Luana, please share your side too. But I think this just goes into the way of us um, really understanding our similars and differences and working with each other because it's about the liberation and it's about our fight for liberation and each other's liberation, each other's community's liberation. And so it's really about us coming together for each other. And it's something that I've really grown to appreciate with myself and Luana's relationship. Yeah. It's, uh, that's beautiful. Um, one of the things I am, I am wondering about, you know, just as, as we have, um, you know, and this is maybe to get your take on stuff that's going on in, in our church a little bit, but, uh, you know, when the Black Lives Matter banner started to get uh, taken down or messed with, uh, what I told my community was, if it's someone of Hawaiian ancestry, perhaps who feels that we don't have the right sign up for what's going on here on this island. And that maybe it's, and I would not want to involve any punitive, personally punitive uh, actions, frankly, against anyone of my ancestry, just simply because the disparate impact that the quote justice system has um, with 60% of people being incarcerated, having Hawaiian ancestry in a place where between six and 10% of people of the population, I mean, that, that's an unbelievable number that is, it just shocks the conscience. And so, but, but still we have the sign, you know, and on an island where we're, we're talking about visibility as you are Luana of, of black people um, and also the fight for Hawaiian rights and dignity in a place uh, that is clearly oppressing uh, both, but maybe disappearing or is invisible, like sort of what, what we're seeing is this sort of invisibility and not wanting to see of the black community and outright, right in our faces, uh, oppression of the Hawaiian community uh, mm -hmm. at once. And so it puts me in a little bit of a wondering, like, how do we navigate this? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess that's a long way of me asking, what do you think of a Black Lives Matter banner? I mean, I have my own reasons why that's there and I have, you know, other reasons. And would something like, you know, Black Lives Matter right next to Hawaiian Lives Matter or Hawaiian Futures Matter is something that I was kind of wondering about. I don't know, what's your, what's your take on this since you're both educators and think about some of these stuff, things? I do think about these things a lot and talk about it a lot. Um, and we're learning as we're going, but I think for, for, for Palama and I, it's like, the medicine has to be specific, right? And so, um, yes, does white supremacy impact all of us, including white identifying people, right? Including mm -hmm. all people of color, white supremacy affects all of us, but it doesn't, all, it doesn't affect us all the same. You can't, there is no analogy between the black experience and the native Hawaiian experience. We are all impacted by white supremacy, but it's not the same. And if we are just to take that system, what if, if we understand what white supremacy is, what, what is the opposite end of that? It's anti-blackness. And so for me, the root of it, of white supremacy is anti-blackness. You would not have an illegally occupied nation in the middle of the Pacific unless you were anti-black, unless you were rooted in anti-blackness. And so I think, um, we've been receiving a lot of backlash for that message, but I, I, a lot of it has to do with education because, because so many of our communities, not only the black community, but the Micronesian community along this totem pole of color um, have been rendered invisible and irrelevant. Um, we're all fighting to be free and to be liberated, but um, yeah the fight is not the same. And so we've talked about things like Hawaiian lives matter. What does that mean to take a term that's very specific to right. the liberation of black people and apply it to native Hawaiians? Must native Hawaiians be free? Must this land be free? Yes, um, but our, our experience and struggle are not the same. That's what, yeah. And uh, Fulama, do you have any thoughts on that or is that, is, are we there? 
yeah. No, I think Luana said it perfectly. You you do not need to put any Hawaiian lands matter <laughs> next to it. Um, I think that um, Black Lives Matter should be held there and it should be held alone because when we understand our history and like Luana said, education, we see it as important and I can identify that we need to not put bandwagons because of other people's struggles. Um, so yeah, just everything we want to say. Yeah, and that dilutes our struggle too. Because yeah. when we're saying Hawaiian lives matter, you're not quite getting it like, at the story and the values and the culture and the language. And that's why we have kukia imauna because that expresses exactly what it is. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's really where, I mean, theologically even where it comes is that 400 centuries of oppression, 400 centuries of theft, of taking of the foundation of a nation and the economic benefits that have accrued only to a, a, a portion of, uh, of the wealth of that nation at the, at the uh, expense of those who uh, suffered is if until you rationalize, like literally it, it also matters because that is what created the wealth that is on display now throughout the globe of this nation is the, is the stolen labor. Um, mm -hmm. So there are many reasons. Our guest last week was a very conservative, he's a friend of mine from high school, conservative Christian Presbyterian down the line. And his comment was uh, exactly similar to what you said, Luana, which is that when you say something, when you co-opt uh, something like Black Lives Matter and say all lives matter, whatever that is, it, it's all about the context and you are taking, you know, the movement uh, and trying to co-opt it or bandwagon it as mm -hmm. uh, Lama said. Uh, so uh, thank you. Thanks for that uh, insight. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanna say, I know we're not running out of time exactly, but I just wanna say 100% that uh, when we are open uh, as an island or, or however you need, if you ever need space for these meetings or for meeting with people. I have an office with lots of couches and there's other space in the building. And I just wanna say that if, if what you ever need is space, please just let us know, All right, right? We're getting, uh, everyone's nodding, my folks. Okay, uh, so just wanted to say that. Uh, and then second, what I'm really kind of also curious about uh, is, is Pulama, your spiritual practice of weaving. Um, and if you could say some about how you learned that, what it means to you, uh, if that's okay, and and then maybe a little about how it came to be part of what it is you're doing uh, with uh, with your education uh, with the six young people. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I started weaving in 2012, and um, it was just kind of. A thing I like to do. I really like hands-on learning. And so, um, but I've come to, um, two of my kumu were family of mine or our family of mine. And so when I started learning this cultural practice, I started learning how much it is a part of my family and a part of my genealogy. My grandma's sister was a weaver. Um, and so it kind of put me on this path to take, to to think of it as a responsibility and to continuing the longevity of this cultural practice. Mm -hmm. um, when I started weaving, I was like the second youngest person in the room and I'm seeing a lot of this older generation. Um, and so it really made me step up into that type of responsibility. Um, and then as I continue to weave, I start to realize that um, if I had this when I was younger, how much it would have helped me in connecting to land, my culture, my identity, my language. And so that really boosted me in wanting to take this into the education field and teach other young Hawaiians, um, especially if they do not have ac access to this cultural practice, to teach them this. And, um, and really it's not just about the skill and technique, but it's really about that ancestral knowledge that gets carried with this practice and knowing yourself 
um, and knowing how to take care of the land is how you know how to take care of yourself. So there's a lot of values and a lot of protocols and a lot of mindsets that you need to be in as a weaver that translates to every other part of you. And so what I see lacking in the education of that social, emotional and personal development in children, I can bring that to the table through weaving. Um, and so that's how it started. And um, weaving is that physical, that physical um, overlaying and making sure things are tight, that brain to hand type of memory um, where you're taking what you learn and you're actually creating something that is a reminder of it, that holds your knowledge. And so that's what I wanted to implement in weaving our stories is that when we are sharing space, when we are sharing story, when we are learning that we have a physical representation that we created that will help us in retaining and remembering and passing down whatever we're creating, we pass down, down our family and those stories pass down as well. Um, so hopefully after COVID is over and these workshops can develop, that will be another component to it. Um, yeah, and that's why I wanted to bring it into this space as well. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and Luana, do you have a, a spiritual practice or a spiritual bedrock that's giving you sustenance through this through this work or that's inspiring you or, um, or not, we're Unitarians, so one way or the other, whatever works for you, but. Um, you know, I, honestly, I find beauty uh, and wisdom in all practices. Jesus is my homeboy, as is Buddha, as is Muhammad, and as are my ancestors. And um, for me, like my daily ritual and spiritual practice is checking in with my ancestors um, every day. I ask them for guidance, um, I listen to them, um, and I offer gratitude. And so my daily prayer is just checking in with those who come before me, the angels that guide me, um, and the land that I, my life is dependent upon. That's my daily practice with uh, myself and my children. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I've been a member of different churches like kind of throughout my lifetime like you know I was raised Catholic and then I you know tried different denominations of Christianity I do have to say I had a really beautiful time I lived in Oakland for some time and I attended the um, Church of Science and Mind in Oakland mm -hmm. and um, and I think it was similar to the the Unitarian Church in that it was non-denominational and so we would have you know the Muslim faith opened the, the, the congregation one day and the next day it would be Jewish and Christian. And I just find so much beauty um, in articulating our connection to the creator in a variety of different ways. So, yeah, I mean, for, but for me, like the consistent practice is checking in with my ancestors every day. Beautiful. Um... We did, we had one question. I want to move to eventually how we can help you uh, or how, whatever you, is there anything we can do for you or the, the, the folks uh, can hear. But one of the questions someone had was um, whether you think structurally in Hawaii, uh, there's the same, recently, I guess uh, at, the, at the church, there was a, a group that shared or a training that shared about the holding back process in the South and in other parts of the country where children of color are held back at a much higher rate uh, than, uh, than white children. Um, and that that leads to a kind of demoralization and a repeat of feeling I'm not going anywhere. And they show the statistics of those who are held back and what it means for their uh, potential to uh, end up in prison or to end up in the social, in the, in the, uh, the system that oppresses them in that way. Is that something that you've seen in Hawaii is, as educators and working in public schools? Is that an aspect that is that is in play here as well, seeing that piece. It was just a, a question. I'm not sure, but I mean, for me, absolutely. Uh, there, there's this one um, line of a, a singer. She says, "We criminalize the symptoms as we spread the disease." I feel like that's that that 
happens in every institution, whether it's education or whatever, but um, I've taught full-time at Kalaheo and I've had kids who spend the entire school day hungry. Yeah. Not, not eating. So how can we expect kids to focus? And we have kids coming from homes where the, 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 the parents are overwhelmed by the anxiety of not finding work, especially during COVID. Um, so yeah, absolutely this affects the, the prison um, pipeline. Uh, and then we're looking at, you know, the drug addiction crisis. How are we coping? It's very difficult to cope, especially now that we're isolated. We're not coping. Um, you know, I I can just say I have a family member who's who was sober for some time and relapsed during COVID. And I was talking to the crisis worker, and she says she, they're seeing, you know, five hundred percent increase in 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 you know addicts, folks that are relapsing. Mm -hmm. So. I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but yeah, everything comes into play when we're talking about our ability to thrive. Are we connected to community? Are we seen? Are we being fed? Um, is there stability in the home? Um, but kind of, you know, when you're living under a socioeconomic system like we do, and, and Dr. King spoke about this toward the end of his life and he got a lot of backlash for it, but Capitalism is one of those many-headed monsters. It's, it's, it, it, it ensures inequity. Yeah. It, many people say it was, you know, the last year of his life was when, uh, meaning at the Riverside Church, literally a year to the day before he was assassinated, he began to speak about uh, the experience of young black men in Vietnam and it being a system of economic oppression not warring, not anything else, but that because of economic oppression it was the only choice they had. And we began to speak about that. Many say that is when he crossed, quote, crossed the line uh, mm -hmm. for people. So uh, right. I've heard lines of songs also that uh, everything's fine and dandy essentially until you start talking about the actual systems that are causing mm -hmm. the problem. So right. um, I, uh, you know, as, as similarly cri criminalizing the symptoms of what is uh, a deeply rooted uh, sickness. Um, so thank you for that. Um, with usually what I like to do toward the end is to say, how can, what in your dream, like how do we support you? How are you looking for the community to support you or other organizations? Um, you know, we, we, we were able to collect some money for you and, and help out with some other aspects, which we're happy to do. Um, but I think people are always kind of curious if there are ways to participate or to help. Uh, and if the answer is money, that's totally fine. Just be honest, you know, but uh, what is it that, that weaving our stories and the work you're doing, uh, a group like this or my folks can help with? Yeah, I, I mean, I just want to say right off the bat, and I'm sure Puloma and she said this, we're deeply grateful um, for your support, thank you. Um, it is, it's allowed us to do this work, especially now during a time when some of us are laid off and the work is not coming through and we're able to continue this important work, especially now when our youth and ourselves need a space um, to come together and commune, so thank you. Good. Um, but yeah, well, if you think of anything or Palama, do you wanna add? Yeah, go ahead. Um, no, just wanted to say mahalo for all the support thus far. Um, it just means a lot to us just to have what we, this opportunity, um, but we will be thinking of you for physical space when we get Dude. maybe after COVID. 100%. <laughs> and the goal is to continue this work. So whether it's financially or even we would encourage in whatever way possible um, on our Instagram, we're always putting out calls for people to like go out and talk to people and ask people these questions and interview them. Um, and it's not to have like a social media online presence, but again, it's just to start to, to create this tapestry of, of stories and people being heard. Um, and so that's one asset, and I'm sure you folks are doing that, doing that already. This is part of creating that tapestry and space for us to share our stories with you, but. Well, yeah. I would also offer this space uh, that we're in now that if any of the folks, the young people you're working with wanna talk about or maybe pair them 
uh, to talk about the synergies of how their projects are going or to to be just be heard and kind of talk some things out. Uh, I think more than half of our our uh, congregation has been a teacher or educator of some kind. So this is really in our wheelhouse of things we enjoy talking about and hearing about. Um, so that's that's one thing. And if if any time in the next few weeks or months you want to just kind of see the space and start like gearing up and thinking about stuff, I'm happy to meet you there and show you around. Uh, we'll just follow our COVID protocols or whatever. Um, or I can send pictures, whatever, just so you can get a sense. Um, so we can you. help. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. That's really exciting. Thank you. Sure. And uh, yeah, that's that's a lot of what we wanted to cover. I just want to say I feel so blessed um, by both of your stories and you taking the time, I know, on a weeknight to come at six o'clock uh, and do this uh, was really, uh, a really, a, yes, we also have a big yard too, uh, was really wonderful and gracious of you both. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you and mahalo. So, yeah. From the bottom of our heart, thank you to all of you to taking your, uh, for taking your time to, to share in what we're doing. So thank you. It's wonderful. So thank you both. And we'll have you back thank soon. You. Thank you.